glad to be here as we talk about uh, uh, our faithfulness. Uh, I'm praying that I will be able to be awake, but Grace is here to hold me. So that uh, I'm glad I'm not preaching, not sitting there. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be, uh, I, I, if I was sitting there, maybe I would have fallen asleep. But because I'm standing, I will be upstanding. Amen. Amen. So somebody wrote an article in, on 9th of March this year. Uh, R.S. Sproul is a, is, a, is a great theologian. And he wrote something. And the question he was asking is, is marriage just a piece of paper? Is marriage just a piece of paper? And this is what he says. The signing of a piece of paper is not a matter of fixing one signature. There are people who have been beneficiaries of me officiating their weddings in this church. So it's not just about the signing of a marriage certificate. It's a, the signing of a marriage certificate is an integral part of what the Bible calls a covenant. A covenant is made publicly. That's why we encourage you not just to come, we stay. But come and declare in the presence. In fact, we keep telling them when you're making their vows. And you say, in the presence of these witnesses, that I, Barnabas, take you, Grace, to be my lawful wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. So it's a covenant that we are making. I think so often we miss that part. We are thinking about the rice and still very plenty. We are thinking about the videography, the, the, the photography, and nowadays they've gone high tech. I mean, the things that are happening in weddings, I, I almost tell Grace, we need to redo our wedding. <laughs> it will go as simple. In fact, those days, you had to do your wedding in a church building. So we had to look for Our church didn't have a, didn't have a building like, 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 like our church, like uh, the world uh, church here. So we had to look for a church with a building. For us to have a wedding. So we went to Good Shepherd Church on Gong Road. That's why we did our wedding uh, 27, almost 28 years ago. So it's not just about those many things. It's a covenant that we are making. And it's a covenant that is made publicly before witnesses and with formal legal commitments that are taken seriously by the community. And the protection of both parties is at stake. So there's a legal recourse that should be one of the partners, uh, should one of the partners act in a way that is destructive to the other. But he says something very, very interesting here as well. He says that no human enterprise renders a person more vulnerable to hurt than does the state of marriage. Let me say that again. No human enterprise renders a person more vulnerable to hurt than does the estate of marriage. I just come back this early this morning. I went on Friday, thought I'll be back on Friday. Uh, Pastor George was worried if this preacher will make it. <laughs> Because when he called me, I had to extend my stay. And why did I go back to the village? We have been having a succession battle in the family. My dad died two, almost two years ago. So it has been a battle. And suddenly, yesterday, we got a breakthrough. We have begun the journey. So it has been hurtful. Do you know for over almost two years, some of us have not talked, members of the same family. And we were meeting yesterday for the first time. You should have seen the tension in the room. People who have grown up together, who have been called by the same name, who bear the same blood and the same gene, but now all of a sudden, you know, sometimes maybe it's good to die poor. <laughs> but when you die, you leave a lot of wealth, you leave people in problems. <laughs> and so that's where we find ourselves in. It has been very hurtful, very painful experience. So we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And thank you so much. In fact, I told the people there that people are praying for us. People are praying for us. And they were, saying, they were very thankful. They said, hey, people are praying for us. They said, yes, I have been sharing that people should pray for us because only God can bring that healing and, 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 and reunite us and, and restore us to where we were before. And so let's talk about faithfulness in marriage this morning. And as we go, let's talk about this. I want us to turn to the book of Matthew and chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. That's going to be our text this morning. Matthew chapter 19, and I'll be reading from verses 3 all the way to verses 12. Matthew chapter 19, uh, verses 3 to 12. But we can start from verse 1. It says, Now when Jesus had finished these things, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea uh, beyond the Jordan. Jesus now about, Easter is, is approaching. All, al all along, Jesus has confined his ministry to Galilee, to Galilee. And so suddenly he's coming to Jerusalem, to Judea. So Christ has come, and the large crowds have been following him. And, have, uh, and were healed there by him. And so in verse 3, the Pharisee, uh, it says, And Pharisees came to him and tested him by, by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And Jesus answered, Have you not read 
that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate, as we always say in the wedding ceremony. And they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And Jesus says, uh, said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now listen to what the disciples said. If such is the case of a man and his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone has, can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. Allow, me, allow us to pray even as we move into this and, and, and uh, uh, unpack this scripture. Father, we pray for the ministry of your word. We thank you for your word that is anointed. And I pray for your anointing upon grace and I as we share your word with these people. And for an equal anointing upon each and everyone who is listening to us this morning. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Now, the great question, the lead question here was a big question that has even engulfed the church today. The question of divorce. This is a major. It did begin today. This question has been there forever. It's been a big thing in the church. And it was a big thing even in Israel. And in Israel at, the, at that particular time, there were two schools of thought. There were those who were students of Shemei who believed that according to Deuteronomy 24 and verses 1 to 4. Now, Moses did not command them to divorce. He advised, he allowed them. He gave them a, 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 an advice in, the, in such a situation that they can divorce. And what, Moses, and then what, what Jesus is, is using here or is referring to here is the book of Deuteronomy 24 and verses 1 to 4. And Moses has not allowed the people to divorce for anything. But he says, Moses allowed, not commanded, he allowed the people to divorce for any indecent thing. Now in the Hebrew word, that indecent thing split them into two schools of thought. There's one school of thought that they, 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 they call the, those who follow Shimei, who believe that the indecent thing, now the indecent thing was not adultery. Because there was a law clear about adultery in Deuteronomy 22.22. When one was caught in adultery, they were to be stoned to death. So here it's not about adultery. He's talking about an indecent thing. So now how to unpack and define that was a problem. And so the other school, the school of, uh, called Hillel, then they said this, this indecent, they didn't, they didn't focus on the word indecent. They focused on the word thing. And that's why the Pharisees come and ask, is it okay for us to divorce for anything? <laughs> because now they become, now again, understand with me, ladies, the society then, like an African society, was male-dominated. Even this one, this is asking, they are men, not women. <laughs> because, they, you know, it favors them. It's, it's like, like the Islamic religion, you know, it's us to say, talaka, talaka, and you go and I marry another one. So they're coming for their own benefit. And so men dominated for, and wanted things to favor them. And so a time came when they would divorce for anything and for any reason. And so Jesus is going back to them. But before he answers them, and that's what we want to focus on this morning, he takes them back to the original. He takes them back to the intent of marriage. And unless we understand the purpose of something, we are wasting our times. And sometimes I wonder if we really understand even the purpose of marriage. Now, I'm a scientist by background. And I've never read anywhere where it says in the year this, somebody by the name Basagadagama or somebody discovered marriage. Akuna, you never read. There's nowhere that somebody discovered marriage. Even our cultural people, they, they, they had some idea. But there's nobody. In fact, if you ask, there are different things, but they knew that people have to get married. Why? Because God instituted the institution of marriage. And so if you want to ask and to know anything about marriage, we go back to the original. We go back to the constitution. In Kenya, you know, if you want to argue about anything, you go back to the constitution. So we go back to him who instituted the 
institution of marriage. And so today, as we look at why do we get married, what's the purpose of marriage, then we can then be able to understand how do we become faithful in marriage. Because so often we are unfaithful. And unfaithfulness is not just about cheating on your spouse. We are going to be seeing how you can be unfaithful and still not be, have cheated on your wife or your husband. But it's important to understand what is the purpose of marriage. Then we see, are we faithful in fulfilling that purpose of marriage? And so Jesus goes back to the very beginning and he's quoting from Genesis chapter 2. He says, have you not read that he, he who created them from the beginning made them who? Made them who? Hey, made them who? Yeah, he didn't make them male and male. Neither did he make them female and female. <laughs> he made them male and female. So those people trying to tell us that we can marry the same sex, that's completely wrong. God knew. If God wanted us to marry the same sex, we would have made male and male. Or female and female. But he made male and female. And it's for a reason. Because when he made the woman, he said, call a woman. A woman, what makes a woman different from a man is that he's a woman. <laughs> and that who is means he has, she has a womb. A man has no womb. <laughs> so when two men marry, how are, you going, how are they going to produce or carry a child? The man sows the seed, the woman receives the seed, and she is the one with the womb to carry the child. So he made them male female. And that's very, very important because male and female are different. I guess that's why we have a, a lot of problems in marriage because of, you know, this male species cannot understand the female species. <laughs> and the female species <laughs> struggle to understand the male species. And that's where the problem is. You know, when I talk to Grace, she tells me some things I'm thinking, hey, okay, that's hard. That's, that's science by itself. Because when I talk to George, it's very direct. <laughs> but with grace, it's not direct. <laughs> it just goes round and round. And the other feelings that are thrown inside there. And you're wondering, what has that to do with what we're talking about? <laughs> we are different. Of course, it's, it has everything to do with what we are talking about. You know, if I was to go to Agis or go to Pila, and we begin to talk, or any other lady here, there is so much. I mean, I just love the way God created us. For us, we are so relational. So one thing connects to another. We can have five different stories in one story. It is five in one. Right, ladies? You know, we can have five different stories in one story. So we start with our children. We end up with our work. Come back to our cousins, who you don't know. And then go to the nation. And then finish off with where we started. So we, we have all those things. But you see, that is why the uniqueness is there. That we were made male and female. I can imagine how boring it would be if all were male. Or how boring it would be if all were female. But God needed to spice things up. God knew that when you have the man and you have the, the woman, there is variety. There are things that she will bring and there are things that he will bring. There is the role of a husband, there is the role of a wife. There are two different things. Because the role of a man, according to uh, Ephesians 5 and 21, 22 going down, is to lead and to love. To love and to lead. But the role of a woman is to do what? Is to submit and to respect. And I know many times we confuse roles and responsibilities. They are roles, but they are responsibilities. Now, responsibilities, we are not told eh, this must be this. The, the man, the lady must bathe the child. Things are changing these days. If you're late at work, you will find your husband has already bathed the boy child. And I would encourage the man to bathe the boy child because at some point, they need to know that daddy looks like me. I, now it is getting quiet. But we, it, is, it is important. You cannot, um, I think it would be very unfair if the lady is, um, is bathing the boy child until they are eight years. You're still, you know, you're still scrubbing the bath. And I'm sure at that time, the boy is even saying, mommy, stop, stop. 
Why? Because she wants to, he wants to identify with somebody who looks like him. And so he begins to know that, wow, I'm a boy. And wow, I look like daddy. And he begins to get some, you know, good, 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 a good behavior. So that he knows that, oh, daddy is a leader. Some of these things are not taught, they are caught. So he begins to see, oh, wow, daddy is a leader. He's the one who says this. He's the one who leads us as a family. No wonder when daddy is away, the boy is still trying to say, mommy, are you okay? I mean, I love it. This weekend, we had a very good time with my boys. They're always like, mommy, are you away? Are you okay? Are you okay? But because they know, they have seen daddy lead. And so they are stepping into that shoe of, hey, leadership and love. So they are roles, but they are responsibility. What is your role as a woman? What is your role as a man? I think that's very, very important because one of the leading causes, according to our InfoTrack uh, research for National Media Group in 2021, uh, 2011 here in Kenya, they found that the leading cause of divorce and separation in Kenya is not what many people think, adultery. That was way down the, 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 the pecking order. The number one reason for the divorce in Kenya now is the gender wars, what they call the gender wars, inequality or fight for equality. And this is where we are having it all wrong because we are confusing ourselves. And so if we then are to play our role as the husband and you're to play your role as, your, as a wife, we need to go back again to the one who instituted the institution of marriage. He knew that we'll be living in 2023. And that still remains the same. They, it cannot change. Yes, the, the, the man can be bathing the, the baby and, and, and cooking. But the role still remains that the wife must submit herself to her husband. Our husband, not just any husband, our own husband. And what is the roles of the men? So, and, and I want to sh sh share with us the roles of the men to see, are we faithful as husbands in fulfilling our roles as husbands? And this is what Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to, 20, to 30. He says, husbands... And I want to read it from the Message Bible because I like how he puts it very, very interestingly. He says, husbands, go all out in your love for your wives. Go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. Man, that's a tall order. You know, so often I look at my neighbors and I think I'm a good husband compared to them. <laughs> but the standard is not George, this is Pastor George. The standard is not Pastor David, a good husband, a wonderful husband. That's not the standard. The standard is as Christ has loved the church. My friends, that's a very high standard. That he even died for the church. I don't know if I'm ready to die for my wife. But, but that's... <laughs> that's how much. That's how much. That's how, but look at this. He says, a love marked by giving, not getting. And I want to correct as men. You know... This, this is the problem we find. I find in, in, in uh, doing counseling so often. A love marked by giving, not getting. You know how we grew up? I'll be honest with you. I told you we were having succession battles because of wealth. I grew up knowing my father provided. So as a husband, as I get married, I know Yangu is giving. And what am I giving? Giving in financial support. Full stop. So I get caught up in looking for money to sustain my family that I neglect my bride. And so often I've seen men shocked. They say, look, I've provided for her everything. And the woman say, no, I didn't need all those things. I needed you. <laughs> That's why we are different, George. <laughs> you know, me, I'm thinking, hey, I am a good husband. <laughs> I have done all this to make sure my family is secure. But I'm never there. I'm hardly there. I'm rarely there. They don't see me. Why? Because I'm so busy. Might be of a friend where one time he came back home and the child started calling him uncle, uncle. <laughs> because that's how, 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 how far away, I mean, how long away he'd been from his children. So ours is love marked by giving. And it's not giving in terms of material. This is important for us to provide materially. But what do you, you know, this is why it's important, George, nowadays as we talk about provision. How do you provide for a, a woman who earns three times your salary? <laughs> so it's not material things. 
is providing security in terms of providing leadership as a husband. That's what leaders, women lead. So that's playing your role. So are you faithful in providing leadership in your home as a man? Are you faithful in loving your wife? He says, Christ's love makes the church whole. His works evoke, his words evoke or call up, bring forth her beauty. So if your wife is not standing up like that, that, that stamp, is not blossoming. Uh -uh. Are your words, your words, causing her? You know, grace is, can be all that she can be just by my words. That's how powerful my words are. Guys, that's a privilege that God has given to you. Even your children. You know, we talk about blessing. It's not just about the praying. It's the words that you speak. For your wife and for your children, those words are huge. That's why, you know, I've never had men complain that she doesn't tell me that she, that she he, he doesn't, uh, I have not had husbands complain that she doesn't, my wife does not tell me that she loves me. <laughs> but for women, <laughs> yeah, not, not, not just because you brought meat can say that you love her. Say it with your mouth. Yeah, that Nigerian preacher was saying, your, your, your mouth won't drop if you say I love you. <laughs> oh, I, I like what it says in that verse 26 that Christ's love makes the church whole and his words evoke evoke, call up call forth her beauty everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her Sometimes I tend to shiver and to shudder when I think of the responsibility that a man has been given. I look at my husband and I say, where that responsibility is, it's up there. Because you're being told to love, you're, you know, you're being asked to love me to the point of dying for me. And you're being told that it is you who evokes. You know, by your words. You evoke, you bring out my beauty. And it is true because words can kill, but words can also build. So you can imagine if as a husband you keep on saying, you woman, you will never make it. What are you doing? Are you evoking her beauty? Are you bringing the best out of her? But when my husband comes home and he begins to speak, one of my best highlights is, when my husband prays over me, I'm telling you that day I can go out and conquer the world. Because he says certain things. You are a woman of God. You will make it. You are the head and not the tail. You're gaining favor wherever you're going. Doors are opening up. And there I'm just like, hallelujah, Jesus. That is exactly what I'm going to do. Because when you go out there, there are giants. And so when the giants come, you slay them by the word of God because you know that already he has put the word of God in me. He has called forth the things that are beautiful. He has brought out the best. And that way you stand as a lady. But if he was just dampening me, when you go out, you go with your shoulders dropping and your head down. And whatever the enemy brings or throws at you, you get discouraged, depressed, you're running away. You're not yourself. And unfortunately, people pick that. You know, so there's the, when we were in school, there was a lady, my math teacher in class five. That lady used to terrorize me. She told me, Ahere, you know, that's my maiden name. Ahere, you and I are like this. You and maths are like this. You're like parallel lines. Say parallel. You will never meet. You will never make it in math. You will, I'm telling you, that woman terrorized me with her words. She told me things until I used to, I believed I did not know math at all. Just because of the words that that lady said and spoke over me. And today, maybe you, there are words that have been spoken over you. Cancel them in the name of Jesus. You may be a single person. Don't wait for your husband or to be to evoke those words. Cancel those words that have been spoken over you that are negative. In fact, she was called Mrs. Okello, and that is when I knew the Lord had healed me. Guess Barnabas' middle name. Okello. So when I meet 
I meet with uh, with Barnabas and we are planning to get married and he says, you know, Okello is my name. So you're going to be Mrs. Okello. I said, no, no, I cannot live with that woman haunting me and following me everywhere. Every time somebody says Mrs. Okello, I'm traumatized. There's a trigger. But of course, the Lord healed me. I uh, became Mrs. Achoki, but the Lord healed me. But what am I saying? Words. Words are powerful. With your words, you will evoke her beauty and bring out the best. And we talk about the ladies in, in, um, in uh, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, understand and support. This is our role as wives. Understand and support your husband in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to the church. Not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership. Wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Are we faithful? Are we faithful in submission? 33 years. And this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself in loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. Are we faithful as wives to honor our husbands? You know, when we started off, and here I'm talking about if you're married for two, two weeks or 40 years or 50 years, when we started off, we wanted to do everything and anything to be faithful in the way of honoring our husbands. He would ask us to do something. Barnabas would ask me to do anything for him. And I would do it. But have I stayed faithful? We need to take that evaluation, that check, to find out, are there things that he will ask me to do? Do I still honor him? Do I still revere him? Do I still prefer him? Do I still look at him and say, you know, my husband, I will do this for you. Do I go out of my way? As born again Christians, our love with Christ is deep. I believe. And whatever happens, there are times you don't feel like you're saved. There are times you don't feel like you're praying. There are times you don't feel like you want to even read the word of God. But you don't stop there. You make effort. And so when we do that, as, our, as, as wives, do we make haste? And do we make that, um, that, that determination to reconnect here? That when there is a disconnect, I want to reconnect. I want to go back and I want to be faithful. Just the way I want to be faithful to the Lord. That I'm asking God, God, help me. Help me to be faithful. Allow the fruit of the Spirit to be operational in my life. In Galatians 5.22. You know, allow this, the fruit of the Spirit to be, to be operational in my life. That when I look at Barnabas, I am saying that I want to be kind. I want to love him. I want to be patient. I want to have self-control when I think everything within me. I'm telling you, even this morning there was a... Hey, good fellowship. You know, I'm thinking, hey, we need to get to church. We need to drop the children. You want to sleep. My friend, you're the preacher. And I'm saying, God, give me that self-control. Help me to tell him the right words. Not words that are going to discourage him, but words that are going to encourage him. How do I support him? Am I supporting him? Yes, in the morning I did not feel supported. <laughs> so your role then is to submit yourselves as wives to your own husbands. And when you talk about submission, a simpler or easier way to look at it is respect. And we talk about love, it's not just the feelings of love. It's that unconditional love that Christ is talking about here. And I know for you men, there are times that, eh, hey, you are wives. But we, are need, we need to love them unconditionally. Not because of what they have done or not done. We need to love them unconditionally. 
And for you ladies, the time you struggle with respecting us as your husbands is when we fail to do what you're supposed to do. Or we are not, when we're not acting, acting like we need to act as men. But the Bible is calling us, calling you here to unconditional respect. Let me say that again. Unconditional respect for your husband. I had a testimony from uh, many years ago, somewhere in Muranga, the slopes of Muranga. This woman, the husband, was a drunkard, the drunkard of the town. You know, every town has a drunkard, and it's known. So he will be the one who is staggering, and you know, I don't know why they, when they're staggering home, they sing gospel songs. <laughs> in the wee hours of the morning, <laughs> staggering back home. And he will come home, and the wife will wake up will warm his food and water for him to bathe faithfully for years. And so one day, too many years, this man is drinking in the bar with his friends and he's saying, today that woman will see. Today I will go home the worst of the worst. And sure indeed it had rained. So he fell on the mud, he's muddy, he has messed himself, he gets home. Guess what? Faithful wife. Unconditionally respecting this drunkard. Wakes up and does all that she's always done. And that night, that old man did not sleep. He had a Kesha by himself. And the Kesha was a Kesha of repentance. <laughs> Repenting until morning. And the following day, he was a born again Christian. A new creature. Ladies, you can tell Pastor George, you can tell us to come and lay hands to cast out devils for your husbands who are not saved. It does not matter if you don't respect that man. The greatest weapon that God has given you, weapon, women, and sometimes you, do, you, you, you don't recognize it, is the power of submission. That will melt the heart of even the hardest of men. Their hearts are melted when the woman, especially a powerful woman, submits to him. <laughs> that just melts his heart. Let me, let me read for you. You know, uh, uh, Paul, in, 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 in talking to the husbands, dedicates only two verses to, tell, to the woman, and then the rest is for the men. And I was saying, Paul was, uh, didn't have a wife. That's why he can talk that way. <laughs> so let's go to Peter, who had a mother-in-law and a wife. Listen to what Peter says. In First Peter, chapter 3. Now, Peter is the opposite. He only dedicates one, one verse to the husbands, but the rest to the wives. <laughs> and this is what he says. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. So, First Peter 3, verses 1 to 7. So that even if some disobey, the Christian message, they may be won over without a message by the way their wives live. Without a message. This woman did preach. She only had to wake up, warm the food, and that's the most powerful gospel to this man. And that changes heart. Even if some disobey the Christian message, they may be won over without a message by the way their, life, their wives live when they observe your pure and reverent lives. Your beauty should not consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyle and the wearing of gold ornaments or fine clothes. Now, we are not saying that you shouldn't do that. Ladies, please, go ahead. It's, 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 especially you are single. Hey, look beautiful. Yes, because it is the outside that will attract the man to the inside. <laughs> so don't just say, me, my beauty is the inside. How will that man spot you? <laughs> So we are not, you know, sometimes people use scripture wrongly. So they say, ah, you should not be braiding your hair. No, 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 no. Nothing wrong with the outward beauty. But more important should be the inner beauty. Wearing of gold ornaments, you know, instead should consist of the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and acquired spirit, which is very valuable in God's eyes. For in the past, the holy women who held, who hoped in God also beautiful, beautified themselves in this way, submitting to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children when you do good and aren't frightened by anything alarming. I've heard of so many daughters of, daughters of Zion, daughters of, may we have daughters of Sarah? Daughters of Sarah. He says, yeah, you should be daughters of, because you imagine following somebody, we talked about leadership, eh? Ajukula Nayanda, 
Yeah, I'm a God has told me, where are we going? I can imagine my wife. <laughs> you know, so often when you get lost in the mall, you know, or, or looking for somewhere, my wife stops afar. You just follow me, don't worry. Well, before they do, I don't, even me, I don't know where I'm going, but just follow me. <laughs> and a great stance, and an angalia. So that really upsets me. Because for me, honoring and submitting to me, you follow me. <laughs> <laughs> you may not know where I am going. And sometimes I don't know where I'm going, but just follow me. <laughs> but I must commend her that in my life I've made two serious transitions. Leaving a corporate job to become a pastor. Now I did not know where I was going. In fact, at that height I'd, I was busy negotiating for better terms, doing interview after interview. And then the church calls me and asks me to be a pastor. And there, they tell me there's no even salary. You know, I've been negotiating for salaries. <laughs> yeah, there's no salary. <laughs> and I, they tell me, go and pray and, and, and talk to your wife. And when I tell Grace, Grace tells me, tells me, you do what God has put in your heart to do. And I quit my job. There's a little baby. Grace has no job. But you're trusting the Lord. And she follows me. Like Sarah, following Abraham. <laughs> Not knowing <laughs> where we are going. But we have not died. Here we are. <laughs> Second time again in that transition. But she has followed. She knows that I've heard from the Lord. And we prayed together. And she said, no, what has the Lord said? Of course, I bounced it back. I bounced it off her. Because I need her support. But it's that submission that has brought us to where we are today. And so as men, are we faithful in our marriages by loving our wives as Christ has loved the church? As ladies, are you faithful in marriage by submitting to your man as you vowed on your wedding day that you'll be submissive to him. That's what faithfulness in marriage is all about for you ladies. Respecting your husbands, being there for them, supporting them. You know, I've seen, I don't know, we don't have that in Kenya. So most of the fans of Goromaya FC are just men. But in America, when they have seen the baseball and the basketball things, the cheering squad was made of ladies only. You know why? There is nothing like the support from a woman to a man. I happened to be in a mixed school, my Forces Academy. It was then mixed before they separated the, the girls. And we were not very good in soccer. And so one time, silly boys came to play soccer in our school. And we thrashed them 3-0. You know why? Because there were ladies cheering. And supporting these boys, you should see the boys, they were falling down, picking them, they played like it was the end of the world. <laughs> Why? Because of the cheering from the ladies. I can remember that sometimes the men will fall, the ladies will come to the field, help them up, and we thrash them 3-0. The return leg was in the silly boys, and we didn't transport the ladies. We were whipped 5-0. <laughs> That is how critical the support of you ladies are to us men. I'm telling you, just your wife telling you, you can make it. Yes, I'm with you, my husband. That's what we need to hear. Because sometimes, I'll be honest with you, we, we even second guess ourselves. We are beaten in the workplace. Maybe you have a boss, a lady boss. You don't feel like any, any man at all. And then you go home now, your wife tells you, oh my goodness, they have killed you. We need your support. We need your support. So as you submit and support us, you are helping us a lot. And that's how we remain faithful in marriage. Wow. We'll be continuing next week, but let's just go one more. But it says in, in Genesis 2 and verse 18, it says, it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helpmate suitable for him. The second purpose of marriage is companionship. As we have, after we have understood our roles as male and female, the next thing is companionship. And you ask the singles, they'll tell you, you know, there are many times they tell you, we are lonely. They are looking for somebody in their lives. God made it that way. Sisters, nothing wrong. When you feel that way, it's, it's good, it's okay. Men, young men, single men, it's okay. Because that tells you that you need to pray to get somebody. Yes, when I was 26, I, one day I came home and I felt, hey! It's lonely. I need somebody in my life. And I, I upped the gears in my prayers and began to pray. But not just to pray. 
The Bible says you watch and pray. This single man just pray. No, the first one there is watch and pray. <laughs> so you watch first. Unaangalia na unaomba. That's why I was telling the ladies to look nice because the watching is to see. And then you men, you watch. Don't just say I'm praying. What are you praying? Are you watching? Because we need to come to that place. According to Gary Chapman, the author of Five Love Languages, says marriage is a covenant of companionship. Marriage is a covenant of companionship. When you're making your vows, you're saying that I'm going to live my life with you. We are going to have a shared life. And we find some people come to us and, you know, a man is telling me, you know, I want to have my life. So I ask them, why did you get married? You should have remained single. You know, the single person, at the end of boys, Friday evening, nobody will bother them. But when you get married, it's another life. You are now sharing your life with somebody else. Yesterday I was in Kisumu, I had to keep calling, and Chris was calling, where are you? Yes, I am accountable <laughs> to her. And it's important for her to know where I am at, and for me to know where she is at. And so we do life together. We have a shared life. And that's the covenant that we made. Otherwise, we'll have remained single and live, continue living our lives single. And nobody will bother you. But when you said, I do, what were you saying I do to? It's a commitment to live a life of companionship. To be together. It's so unfortunate that some people are lonely in marriage. They're called married singles. You yeah, that term, married singles. And it's, it's true. It's a fact. And may the Lord help us. Are we faithful in being a companion to your spouse? Are you faithful? I'm seeing some elderly ladies here. You know, Titus 2.4. Paul is talking to the, uh, the elderly ladies and he says, you older women, do you have any older women in the house? <laughs> yes. You older women, teach the younger women. What does he say? Teach or admonish you young, young men to love their husbands and to love their children. Now, the word that, the, you know, English is limited. Greek and Hebrew and our mother tongues are, are heavy. You know, in my mother tongue, I can define a cousin from my mother's side, a cousin from my father's side, an uncle from, you know, but in English, it's just uncle. <laughs> so English is very limited. <laughs> but our mother tongue, like Hebrew and Greek, are very loaded. So sometimes we read the Bible and we don't get it. The, when, when, when the Bible is talking about husbands love their wives, it uses, it uses the word, the word there is agape, unconditional love. When the, when, the, when the older women are being told to teach the young women to love their husbands, the word love there is not agape. Neither is it eros. It is phileo. It's saying to like their husbands. To be a body to their husbands. That's how we do companionship with the husband. You like him. You hang around. You watch Liverpool with him. <laughs> that is a companionship that a man is looking for from his wife. You know, for my wife, it's just to sit down and we talk we're in the restaurant. That's how for her is companionship. For me, it's doing something with her. <laughs> That's how men are. We are either going to the chamber together. We are doing something together. That's companionship. It's different from ladies and from men. So you cannot leave your husband and say, yeah, those are men things. No, you are, we, all the women, we should teach them to like <laughs> First question, ask, ask him. Uh, when she tells you, I've met a man. Okay, yeah, yeah. As you go progress, do you know which team he supports? <laughs> that's how you think that's so spiritual. It's part of that. How are you going to like somebody you don't, you don't know what he likes? Let me confess my sin. When I was dating Grace, I hid my passion of football from her. <laughs> so I was moving to Akanisa and spent time with her. So she, after we get married, and a couple of years later, we get a television. Eee! She discovered there's something like Champions League, EPL, all of a sudden. But you see, when I was dating, I never told her even once that I'm going to watch football. That's the, that's the problem. That's the mistake I did. I wish I'd told her. So that when she's coming in, she knows who she's getting married to. And so she begins to do her research and to know which team is playing today. <laughs> 
Now I was telling them, you know, like, like last Sunday, you know, when we whipped some people seven nil. So if you're the wife, if you're the wife of that person who has been beaten seven nil, who, who, somebody that Kwanza, before I could get you money, you know how to treat him. That <laughs> come up results and put a mekuja and people seven nil. What do you expect? <laughs> In fact, it would be very serious. If you say, I, Kwani, what, who, what was wrong with your goalkeeper? <laughs> what was wrong with him today? He should have known. Whoa, it is not a joke. So friendship. And I tell the single ladies, marry a friend. And the single men also, marry a friend. Marry a friend that you can develop that friendship with when you get married. There are things that you do. Do you have shared goals? Are there not shared goals? Shared interests. Things that you enjoy doing together. Yes, you love coming to the well together for church. But apart from that, are there other things that we enjoy doing together? Go for mountain climbing. Go where, what, what is it that you enjoy doing together? Because these things are going to count when you get married. And if you're married, do you have shared interests? Have you sat down to say, hey, I want to be faithful to you. And so I want to find out what are your interests. What are the things that you like to do? Because I want to spend my time with you. I want to be faithful with you. I mean to you. Because if you don't do that, you will find somebody out there who shares interests with you. So what will you do? You're going to put a lot of energy on the other side and forget about your spouse. And that would be very sad. So if you're going to be in a, in a relationship, if you're looking forward to getting married, find out from that person what are their interests, what are the things that will, you know, or what are the things that you think you would have wanted to do in future. If you're married, go back to the drawing board. And it is okay, it's never too late. Find out. What are some of the things that you like to do? What are some of the things that we like to do? Is there a convergence? Can we say that this is you, this is me? Uku katikati, these are the things that we like to do. And these are the things we will tell. Because that really makes us become more friends. It enhances our friendship. Because this is the person that you're sharing life with. But if we don't have things that bring us together, we will be chasing my own things. He chases his own things. When the children are gone, I'm wondering, so who did you say you were? What, what was your name again? The middle name. And he's asking me the same question. And we find there's nothing that brings us together because the, the relationship was more functional than relational. A relationship has two sides. The functional side and the relational side. So many times in marriage, sorry, not a marriage relationship. So many times as couples, we are caught up Doing the function of what and Shule, children are going to school, we are paying rent, we are paying mortgage, we are doing this, we are doing that. But what about here? How are we increasing and enhancing this relationship? Because that is what is going to keep us going. We don't want to be strangers at 50 years. We don't want to be strangers when we are 70 years in marriage. We are wondering, okay. I wish the Lord would take us home together very quickly. No. You want to enjoy here on earth and say, this is my friend. I've told Barnabas that I want to, when I'm 80 years and the Lord still gives us time together, I want us to be walking in the streets of Nairobi or wherever we shall be, if it is Kusumu, wherever it is, and still say, this is my friend. This is the person that I got married to Yes, there have been ups and down, downs, and we are not focusing on the downs, but we are focusing on the positives. Because he's my friend. I want to remain faithful to him. And I would want him to remain faithful to me. Let's talk about faithful. He's faithful to that companionship. We are faithful because remember you've made a covenant of companionship. The, 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 more, the, the more blessed are the sisters. The sisters are powerful jobs. The men are they come back to us, what do we need to do? Because they look for leadership in the man. Are we providing that leadership? But one of the greatest frustrations for many ladies is my husband is not providing leadership in the home. Be it spiritually, 
financially, always, are you providing that leadership? Are you loving your wife? Are you there together and living a shared life? Wives, are you supporting your husbands? Are you his greatest cheerleader? Are you supporting? We've been touched by Sheila, you know, when we began Men of Purpose. She, has, she would sit there behind, supporting George. From behind there, the only, the only man, the only woman, <laughs> the only woman among, among men. But she would be there faithful Thursday by Thursday. You don't know how much that meant to George. That's the support. It's not by what you say. Just being there speaks volumes. Being there by your man speaks a lot. Support them. But also respect to them. Remember, it's an unconditional respect. That just brings out, you know, we talked about our words evoking her beauty. Your respect and your submission evokes everything in a man. That man can go and kill Goliath, can climb the mountains when he knows that he has a wife who supports him and submits herself to him. Let us pray. And even as I pray this morning, I want to invite us if you're a married couple, I want to pray first for the married couples. And you're here, and one way, there's been a struggle. You have maybe found yourself unfaithful, be it in fulfilling your roles as a husband, be it in fulfilling your roles as a wife. Or probably you've found yourself lonely in that marriage, or doing your own, you're doing, doing me, they, they talk about doing me, doing life alone. Instead of doing life together. And so in that sense, you have been unfaithful in your marriage. I want to ask us and invite us to just as husbands and wife, we just come together as husbands and wife, for those of us whose spouses are here. Let's just pray that the Lord will heal us, the Lord will touch Father, we pray for the husbands who are here this morning. Lord, I pray that you will forgive us for not being faithful in providing leadership in our homes. Lord, I pray that you will forgive us for not loving our wives even as you, Christ, has loved us giving ourselves even for them laying down our lives for them listening to them Lord being there for them Lord I pray that you will forgive us if in any way we have failed in being courteous to them in treating them as a weaker vessel even as Peter admonishes us Lord, you will again remind us of what it means to be faithful in playing our role as a husband in that marriage. And Father, we pray for the ladies. We pray that you will forgive us, O oh God, in areas that we have not been faithful as wives. Father, we know that we have not submitted maybe the way we need to we may have not uh, respected our husbands the way we need to. We have fallen short and we have forgotten and left our first love. We ask that you forgive us this morning. We pray that you will bring us back to that place where we need to do what we need to do. And most of all, we pray that we will, you will bring us back to you because in bringing us back to you and being so connected to you, you whisper words to us and tell us, go back and love him this way. Go back and be kind to him. Go back and be patient with him. Go back and have self-control. Go back and use your tongue well. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit is going to be so alive in us and we will not block him or bar him whispering those words to us but we pray that 
the Holy Spirit of God is going to continue to teach us. He who is our greatest teacher. Who is, that he'll continue to teach us on what we need to do. Just simple things are things that mean volumes to our husbands. So we pray that God, even as you forgive us this morning, that we are rising up again and we are able to do what you asked us to do. We are submitting and we are respecting because you say in your word, Lord, that he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. That will be that good thing that the men have found. will be that good thing that the husband has found. We thank you, God, because you're giving us the wisdom you're giving us the knowledge. God, you're giving us the understanding to build that home. In Jesus' name. Father, we continue to pray for those that we are hurting in one way or another in their marriages. Probably have felt so all alone, have felt abandoned, have felt forsaken. Lord, we pray for your healing. Lord, we pray that you will heal them. You will touch them, Lord. Father, we pray that even as you do so, you also will convict their spouse to not humble ourselves, themselves to just come back, to reconnect, and to ask for forgiveness that their marriage and relationship may be healed. Lord, we are also aware of those that may be here and may have found themselves they wanted, but they may be finding themselves separated or divorced. But Lord, I pray for them. You know, the pain, the heart, this brings upon us. But Lord, you are a good God and a faithful God. May you heal them. May you touch them. Even as the word of the Lord came earlier to us, there is hope. May they sense that there is hope. No matter their age, no matter how long it has been, may they find May they sense that hope that, Lord, you are a God of a second chance. You are a God of restoration. And that, Lord, as you heal them, as they move forward, they're going forward as a different person. And that in due time, you'll bless them with somebody who will treat them well. And that, Lord, even as they look forward, the past will not haunt them. The past will not hold them back. Pray for the singles that are here, Lord, as they have heard your word this morning. May this be lessons for them to prepare themselves before that, Lord, as they come into that time that they are getting married themselves, they are well equipped, well prepared, even to enter into this place, into that space, soberly and with the knowledge that is required. So I pray, Lord, that in your own time, you will bless them with a companion to do life together with. So we give you thanks, Lord, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you so much. Next week, part two. <laughs>